Hello everyone, welcome to Analysis 1 video 26. At the end of the last video I asked is it the case that every sequence has a convergent subsequence and the answer was sort of immediately no because the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on doesn't have a convergent subsequence. The next question I asked was does every bounded sequence have a convergent subsequence and that's what we're going to try to resolve now. And we're going to do that by starting with something called the scenic viewpoints theorem. So, uh, maybe unusually poetic name, but I will draw you a picture in a moment that will hopefully help to explain it. What it says is that if the sequence AN is a real sequence, then it has a monotone subsequence. And remember, monotone means increasing or decreasing. And you might already be thinking ahead to, well, what would that tell us about bounded sequences? But we won't rush ahead just now. We'll prove the scenic viewpoints theorem first. Uh, just a practical note for anybody who's interested, the reason I have gained this sort of strange glow is because I'm playing with the lighting in my kitchen to see whether I can illuminate my handwriting a bit more helpfully for you. So this has involved complicated things involving dismantling a bedside lamp and propping it on a kitchen table in a strange way, but hopefully um, it might help with the handwriting. So what's the idea of the scenic viewpoints theorem? Well, let me try to draw a picture. Uh, maybe I'll just draw that here. So uh, I've got my usual axes for drawing a sequence and I'll draw on some points of my sequence which might be positive or negative. They're going to kind of hop around a bit. Who knows what it is they do? Here we go. Here's some points of a sequence. And a scenic viewpoint or a peak of the sequence is going to be a point like this one up here because this is point is kind of high up and if we look forwards from this point so look at later terms in the sequence nothing gets in the way of the view that is all of the terms of the sequence later than this one are smaller so this is a peak or a scenic viewpoint uh, let me try to find another one so the next point in the sequence isn't because there's a point after it that blocks the view uh, but then this point here is another peak. It's not as high as the previous peak. If you think about it for a moment, that's inevitable because the previous one was a peak. But it is still a peak because if we look later on, we don't have an impeded view. And then I guess as I've drawn it here, it looks like we've got another peak here and another peak here. I mean, there are still another infinitely many terms of the sequence to come. Who knows what might happen? But I hope the picture gives you the kind of idea. And what we're going to do to prove the scenic viewpoints theorem, to show that our sequence has a monotone subsequence, is to think about two cases. So one case is where there are infinitely many peaks, and we will argue that they must form a decreasing sequence. So you might be able to see from the picture I've drawn already why they would form a decreasing sequence. Um, the other case is where there are only finitely many of these peaks, and that means that after some point, no point is a peak. And so there's always a later term of the sequence that's larger, and that's going to allow us to argue that there's an increasing subsequence. So that's the kind of executive summary of the proof. I will write that out carefully now. So we've got a real sequence AN. We want to show it's got a monotone subsequence. And I'm going to let V be the set of all K in the natural numbers, such that if M is bigger than K, then AM is less than AK. So this is the set of peaks or scenic viewpoints. Uh, so I'll just kind of put a little note in purple somehow. These are the kind of peaks. This is not a technical term, but hopefully this helps you to kind of see how it relates to the picture um, that I showed you just now. So there are going to be two cases. Case one is where there are infinitely many of these. So what happens then? Well, let's say the elements of V are K1, less than K2, less than K3, and so on forever. So I'm just listing the elements of this set in order because I want to pick out the subsequence. Uh, so A, K subscript R, as R there is, is a subsequence of A, N. And it must be decreasing and is decreasing because if R is less than S, then KR is less than KS. That's how we've constructed our 
k's, and so a k r is greater than a k s because we know um, that k r was a peak. So if a k s comes later, then it must be smaller. So in that case, we get a decreasing subsequence. Let me just create myself a little bit more space on my page here. So case two is going to be the case that V is finite. And that means that there's a largest element. So then there exists an N such that if K is greater than N, then K is not in V. And what I'm going to do is now kind of just build a sequence, because if we let M1 be like N plus 1, say, then M1 isn't in V. So that means that there's some point later than it, some term later than it in this, than A M1 in the sequence that's bigger. So there exists an M2 greater than, well, in fact, greater than M1, sorry, with a m2 greater than or equal to a m1. Otherwise, m1 would have been in v. And then m2 is not in v. So there exists an m3 greater than m2 with a m3 greater than or equal to a m2. And so on. So we can continue inductively. to construct M1 less than M2 less than M3 and so on with A M1 less than or equal to A M2 less than or equal to A M3 and so on. And then A M R is an increasing subsequence of A M. Now that we've proved the scenic viewpoints theorem, we're in good shape to have a look at the bolzano weierstrass theorem, which is one of the high points of this course. It's a really important result. And it's named after Bolzano and Weierstrass, who were the two of the key figures in um, putting analysis on rigorous foundations, I guess. So the bolzano weierstrass theorem says, let the sequence AN be a bounded real sequence, then the sequence AN has a convergent subsequence. So any bounded real sequence has a convergent subsequence, which is pretty cool when you think about it. So how are we going to prove this? Well, I'm going to do this one on a slide because actually it's really a case of gluing together pieces we've got already. There aren't really any new ideas apart from how do we assemble everything we've done so far. So we've got a bounded real sequence. By the scenic viewpoints theorem, that has a monotone subsequence because we just proved that every real sequence has a monotone subsequence. So let's take a monotone subsequence and then it must be bounded because the whole sequence is bounded and consequently any subsequence is bounded. So now we have a monotone and bounded subsequence that must converge by the monotone subsequences theorem. That was the one that says that a bounded monotone sequence converges. Oh. And there was our convergent subsequence. It was there almost before we knew it. So the key thing was really that we'd proved the scenic viewpoints theorem and we proved the monotone sequences theorem and gluing those together meant that we could prove bolzano weierstrass very quickly. But don't be misled, it's a, a deep result building on work that we've done earlier. I have two favourite proofs of the bolzano weierstrass theorem, that's one of them. Um, with the other one, I thought what I'd do is make it into a kind of proof sorter quiz activity thing um, on Canvas. So have a look at that um, if you've got a few minutes and you'd like to give that a go. I hope that will be quite a fun activity as well as quite a useful one for you. Another remark is that the monotone sequences theorem and the scenic viewpoints theorem make sense for real sequences but not for complex sequences in general. Just think about why that is. But the bolzano weierstrass theorem that a bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence, there's nothing intrinsic about the statement of that result that means it has to be about reals. There are no inequalities between terms of the sequences there. So maybe the Boltzmann and Weierstrass theorem could hold for complex sequences. Dot, dot. 
I've called this corollary 43. That might be a bit controversial because it is a theorem, but I sort of want to highlight that it's a consequence of the theorem that we've already proved rather than a whole new thing. So this is Botsano Weierstrass for complex sequences, and it says let the sequence Zn be a bounded complex sequence, then the sequence Zn has a convergent subsequence. So basically Botsano Weierstrass holds for complex sequences too. And the reason I've called it a corollary is that I want to highlight that we're going to deduce it from the result for real sequences rather than going back to the drawing board. So let's take the sequence Zn, a bounded complex sequence, and let's write Zn is Xn plus Iyn, where Xn and Yn are reals. Because what I want to do is think about the real sequences, Xn and Yn, and argue with them. So we know that the sequence Zn is bounded. If we say uh, the modulus of Zn is less than or equal to m for all n greater than or equal to 1, so we're saying that m is a bound for our sequence, well then certainly the sequence Xn and the sequence Yn are bounded by m as well. That actually goes back to something that we did, it feels like a long time ago now, in the complex numbers course, where we commented that when we looked at the definition of the modulus, we could see if the modulus of a complex number is at most m, then the modulus of the real part and the modulus of the imaginary part are each at most m. Okay, so xn and yn, these sequences, they're bounded by m, and they're real. So by bolzano verstrass Let's just focus on one at a time here, because the plan is to kind of reduce repeatedly to subsequences. So the sequence Xn has a convergent subsequence, which we might call, say, X subscript NR. So that's a convergent subsequence in the reals. And what I want to do now is focus on the yn's, but in fact only focus on the yn-r. So only pick out the terms corresponding to this subsequence. So then yn-r is a bounded real sequence, because it's a subsequence of a bounded real sequence. So by bolzano weierstrass which I will abbreviate to BW the second time, it has a convergent subsequence, say, y, n, r, s, kind of stacking up these subscripts. This is not super convenient notation, but it'll do the job. So the real part, we took a convergent subsequence. Then we looked at the relevant subsequence of the imaginary parts and refined again to a convergent subsequence. If we look back at the real parts of that refined subsequence, so x, NRS is a subsequence of the convergent sequence XNR. I'm trying to make my R's and N's look different for you. So it converges. We proved previously that a subsequence of the convergent sequence converges. So the real and imaginary parts, if you like, in these subsequences converge, and so Z, N, R, S converges. Uh, I think that might have been theorem 33, the one that says that a complex sequence converges if and only if the real and imaginary parts converge. And we've shown that in this case the real and imaginary parts do converge, and so the whole sequence converges. I'm not going to show you any applications right away of Botson and Weierstrass. They will come in due course. I'm going to wrap up this video in a moment. Just before I go, something for you to think about. If I have a sequence An and it converges, does that mean that An minus An minus 1 tends to 0? Question. Second question, if I've got a sequence An and I tell you that An minus An minus 1 goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, does that mean that the sequence converges? So there's, there's sort of two directions there. So that's something for you to have a think about, and we will start having a look at that in the next video. See you soon.